Okay guys, today we're talking about Puritan women uh, and in Puritan society. And, and so in, under, to order in, in order to understand um, what was going on and, and how, what the role of women was in Puritan society, you really have to look at um, making sure you understand a little bit of their background um, and also just uh, the structure of English colonization. Um, so we're gonna start with who were the Puritans and, and also the um, making sure it's clear with the English colonization, right, how uh, the two groups were separated. So before we get into just their background exactly, I want to make sure that uh, you have an idea with the Chesapeake that we just looked at and then the New England uh, region. The Chesapeake uh, was what we just talked about with early English colonization. And those were largely people who were Anglican, part of the Church of England, um, and we'll look at more of their motivations in a little bit, just as a refresher. Uh, and that was those were the people who went to Jamestown and largely started in Virginia and then spread out to the Chesapeake region from there. And then with New England area, that's where the Puritans went. Both were English. And both, so the early English colonization technically can uh, includes what we looked at last week with with early English colonization in the Chesapeake and Jamestown and um, women in that role, and the Puritans. They're separated because they are very very different peoples, and um, how they set up their societies, what they did, um, the structure of women. Are, are there's there's not a lot of similarities and so you we tend to say like early english colonization is the chesapeake and then you separate and say puritan colonization or puritan society but again technically the puritans were english um but they they had their own set of colonization structures and organization so for the background of who were the puritans uh it comes that they come about with the protestant reformation now the protestant reformation we're not going to go into a whole long uh, spiel on on that. You could have a whole lecture on just the Protestant Reformation. The key things to know with that was that before the Protestant Reformation, you had um, Catholicism, and that was it. Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church, and that was the the, the Christian religion. Um, and there wasn't another branch or anything like that. We have hundreds and hundreds now of different denominations that consider themselves Christian, but at the time, the Catholic Church was it. Now, there, was, there had been in the past schisms within the church itself, but no, uh, no break from like Catholic uh, ideas and views. So what happens is then you have Martin Luther, and he was looking to reform the church. So he just wanted reform. He wasn't initially looking for when he presented his theses to, um, uh, well, the academic world. He wasn't looking to reform, um, or he wasn't looking to change the church. He wasn't looking to create a new one. He was looking simply to reform it because the Catholic Church had grown so large and because there, it really had a monopoly on, on the religious world. As an institution, it become very, very corrupt. As much as, as people say the Catholic Church is corrupt today, it was far, far more corrupt back then. Um, it didn't start out that way, and then it just over time got very, very corrupt in terms of the, the popes and, and the bishops and cardinals and everyone. They, they had wives and kids, and the pope was, was mixed with politics in, in ways that are far beyond what it is today. Um, and his biggest issue was what was called indulgences. Um, well, there, there were several, but that was a big one. He didn't, he felt that the, the friars and the lower level church people were um, selling the church and selling indulgences, which could help you get into heaven, get out of purgatory, get into heaven. Um, and so he had, he had a lot of issues with the church. So he put out his reform and the church was not happy with him. They, they told him he had, they demanded that he recant. He went on trial. He refused to recant. Uh, and this led to a break between Catholicism and Protestantism. And so you get a, a different sect of Christianity, essentially, with the Protestant Reformation. 
Um, and from that, you get several different um, um, subgroups um, or denominations, if you will. Lutheranism was one, um, but the other ones that come out of that, um, so here we can put that here. Um, well, we'll just, Martin Luther is already one, right? And then we'll put Calvinism was another one. Zwingli, Zwingliism was another, <laughs> but um, the, 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 and they break from there even further as time goes on. So, but Calvinism is the important one because Calvinism is where we're going to get the Puritans. Uh, John Calvin uh, was the founder of Calvinism, the Lutheranism, Calvinism, they get their name from the person, the founder. Lutheranism, Martin, with Martin Luther's version and John Calvin's version had some similarities as far as what they rejected with the church. Um, and then he also had some differences uh, as, as well. Um, the, the biggest thing that um, is important to the Puritans and their development has largely to do with um, predestination and, and predestination uh, is the idea that it's already been determined uh, whether or not you're saved or not. And, and so it technically doesn't matter what you do uh, because you're, you've, it's, already, it's already been set in stone if you're either saved or not saved. And um, the Puritans are going to keep that idea with them. Um, the other thing that he believed in was the importance of um, a society. Um, so this, this was unique to Calvinism and then Puritanism, um, which was a strong emphasis and belief in creating a, a religious community and society where they built their own town or city, which then was built on religious rules. Um, and, and part of this had to do with the belief that uh, Calvin, uh, John Calvin kind of saw people as inherently bad and they had to be forced to be good and to follow the laws. And so if you created a religious society that then that town, um, the laws and culture and structure was centered around that, then it would uh, encourage people to, to follow the correct rules, right? He kind of felt like uh, the outside world was corrupt and ultimately people wouldn't follow the religious rules that they were supposed to outside of a religious community. So he created that society and the Puritans are going to take that idea with them as well. And then the other key thing that came out of that was um, what was called the good wife. And it really, this is with a view of women. Um, there's the, in, in Catholic uh, belief, or we're certainly in how it played out with the role of women in the church. Uh, women had a very limited role within the church. Uh, and that, that you, in early Christianity, they had a much larger role and then they slowly got pushed out into, um, kind of a very limited, uh, range for what they could do. Um, and, but there were two prevailing views of women, uh, in the Catholic church. Which, was, which were just on opposite ends of the spectrum. You had the, um, the Virgin Mary, which then the nuns kind of replicated. That was one role that women could have in the Catholic Church was to be a nun. Um, but the idea of like says vir a vir the Virgin Mary, virginity, um, a, as the ideal role of women put up on this pedestal. And, and of course that wasn't like practically applied, but the idea was, right, that was the highest level. And so nuns, uh, you know, mar being married to God, uh, ha not um, having sex, that was all replicating that idea of the Virgin Mary. And then you have um, uh, the other view, uh, which was Mary Magdalene and the prostitute. So uh, it's either a woman as a prostitute or a woman as a virgin. And you had uh, nothing kind of in between as the ideal role of women. Calvin uh, said that women were, um, sexual beings. And this was actually true. We'll, we'll look at when this shifts. Um, but, uh, generally in society, uh, during this point up until the revolutionary war, um, it was believed that women were more sexual than men. And, and, 
um, that they they had more sexual desires and urges and it was hard to control. And so he argued that he men had them too, but women were the more sexual beings. It's going to shift in the Revolutionary War to men are more sexually based than women. Um, so the whole kind of modern view we have of where we're always talking about that idea of men as, as the ones that are super sexual and women are not, that, that was not the case at this point in time in history. And, and so he argued that because the reality was is that women and men, but more women, couldn't control themselves in these urges, it was better to get married than to sin. Because, of course, within uh, uh, both Catholicism and at Protestant religions, um, premarital sex was uh, a sin. And so um, you know, he said, you know, since they have all of these urges and women are sexual beings, it's, it's inevitable that most are not going to be capable of the virgin uh, view or ideal. So he created a new ideal, which was actually, in, in this case, not a bad thing. There's a lot of restrictions and rules within Calvinism and, and Puritan belief. But this was actually a, a more positive view of, of women within the religion, within the Christian religion, which was that the uh, ideal role for women was the good wife. It's why um, when we, we're going to look at um, some transcripts from Salem witch trials in, in, a, in the next lecture, and they, they say the title of a lot of the women is goody, right? And, and that's short for good wife. So this became the title, good wife or shortened goody, uh, of women. And so the ideal role was to be married and have children. So, I mean, this wasn't revolutionary. Women's roles had always been to be married and have children. But what was significant, and again, why I say this was a more positive view, is that, the, that for the Christian uh, belief, you now have, for the first time, an emphasis on um, women as the ideal role being married and having children, not virgin or prostitute. One negative, one positive, and, and lar largely unattainable for the, the virgin uh, ideal. Now you have an ideal that's one that most women could obtain and did obtain because that already was in, in a clear role for women in society. So. That in itself was a more positive view because it, it, it gave women this, this positive option that most would have throughout their life at some point. Okay, so that's the background of, of, of what was going on. Um, what happens is uh, the Puritans are going to be the English um, version of, of Calvinism. So Puritans equal the English version they, they practice uh, uh, mostly the same thing as, as Calvin, um, as John Calvin and, and his views with their religious doctrine. Um, but they were the ones that were, they were the English, whereas Calvin was not, um, and his society and, and city was not. They um, first left England because, not all of them, but a large group of them left England because they claimed that England was... Um, uh, not religious enough and corrupt. So it is important, like not all Puritans left, but the Puritans that left and then are going to end up migrating to New England, um, they moved around. So not religious and corrupt. They went first uh, to other parts in Europe that took them in. Uh, but then as they got there, uh, so Europe was next. They decided that Europe was too liberal. They didn't like that. I mean, one of the reasons why they were allowed in was the idea of religious to uh, tolerance and freedom. And they didn't like with how their children were developing. And so they decided to leave. So then finally they go to New England and the goal of colonizing. And so they had a very specific purpose with, with going to America. Um, you know, the, the king had to grant a charter uh, in order for uh, people, English citizens, to um, settle, especially if you didn't want to piss off the king or have problems that way. The Virginia Bay Company had been given one for the Chesapeake, and they um, were basically kind of given one by the king of like, yes, please just leave and stop bugging us. Like, people didn't particularly care for the Puritans in England because they were kind of nitpicky and annoying. There was a lot of like, stop dancing, stop drinking, you're, you're doing all these things wrong. 
And the average uh, English uh, person was kind of like, ah, the Puritans. And so when they asked for a charter to, to go to New England, it was kind of like, sure, please leave us alone and stop being annoying. So they get a charter on their own to form their own community. And their, their goal was, well, what J John Winthrop um, uh, was looking to say was a city upon a hill. Now, they are, they are not, these are the people we're talking about here are not the pilgrims. There are two groups of, of Puritans. You have the early pilgrims that show up, uh, and that's like the, the Mayflower and, and Plymouth Rock. They um, don't flourish into a larger community. The second wave of Puritan migration is with John Winthorpe, who becomes the one of the main leaders, and they're the ones that are going to flourish and, and become a larger Puritan society. Okay, so just to make sure that's clear, um, because sometimes there's the people mix up and assume that these early Puritans that we're talking about here were the pilgrims, um, but that, that was a separate group um, that, that do come over, but ultimately, like I said, they, they don't flourish and they don't expand. Um, and and it's, it's the second wave that's the much larger wave of people that then settle down. Their goal was to create um, their own religious society. And um, the city upon the hill, which is the, uh, the famous line uh, from one of John Winthrop's uh, speeches, it was the idea of being able to create kind of this insulated um, community that they could practice their religious beliefs and keep people in line and, and create the rules, just like John Calvin wanted, of, of establishing the rules and laws connected uh, with to their religious beliefs rather than the immoral, uh, you know, secular laws. They, one of the misconceptions that also comes from this is they were not for uh, religious freedom outside of their own. So they, they left to, and moved to uh, New England um, because they wanted religious freedom to, to build their own community, but they were very intolerant of everyone else. And they kicked out a lot of members in society um, because they disagreed um, with, with policies. Um, so a lot of Puritans became ex-Puritans and exiled. In fact, Rhode Island was created from um, and founded by an ex-Puritan who got kicked out, exiled from his, his community. Um, <clears throat> and we'll look at another woman who gets exiled as well. So not, they did not found, not, neither the Chesapeake with, with um, that group with early English colonization, nor the Puritans founded you know, uh, their societies based on religious freedom. That, that is a complete misconception that, that United States was founded on religious freedom. It, it gets connected later to, you know, um, really uh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. But if you're looking at the earliest people coming, the Puritans did not come to establish re religious freedom for anyone but themselves. They were very, very intolerant of other religious beliefs and uh, up to a point challenging their society even as it was. And they didn't, they didn't have any qualms about kicking people out. So what I wanna look at, that's the kind of the reasons for um, uh, why they decided to show. Um, I wanna look at the passenger list. Um, we'll, we'll put that here so we can put a few thing notes about it after we look at it, um, that I gave you of two groups. Of, of, of people. So if we go to the passenger list, <clears throat> you have the passengers bound for New England and the passengers bound for Virginia. Let's look at the passengers bound for Virginia. All right, so the, for, for the passengers bound for Virginia, 1634, um, right, this is the Chesapeake area. This, these are the people we already talked about. So hopefully what you notice when you looked at this list are a couple of things, right? One, they've separated them for us, so it makes it easy. These are the total number of women coming over on this ship to Virginia, right? So you have a relatively small number of women. The, mo the majority of it are men. 
Um, and the other thing that hopefully you notice is while we have a few with the older age, the majority of, of age is 20 and uh, younger, right? Well, mid, mid 20s and younger. Um, and they're not, um, then you don't have too many older men and no older women, um, coming over. You do have a few younger kids, um, 16, 14, right. But, but by and large to 16 and up, uh, and then just through the, the mid twenties and only a few that, that are above that. It does look like there's a few siblings the, and relatives that you see between the two, but they're mostly in individual people. Um, and, um, the men far outnumber the women and they have smaller numbers. Okay. So why is that? Well, what it can tell us about society. And I think this is what's interesting with these, the passenger list is, is just looking at the ship manifest of who is coming over. It could give you an idea of the structure of the society. So why were more men coming over than women? Why were they younger men, uh, for the most part, right? Why were they not family units? Well, because they were, uh, probably a lot of these people were indentured servants. Uh, the majority of these probably were not paying their own way. Um, and that they were indentured servants. These women were most likely coming over, uh, as tobacco brides and maybe a few as indentured servants, right? And so, um, that's based on, of course, the structure that with the early Chesapeake area was largely men that were going over to, um, as indentured servants after that first group of people and survival, right? This is 1634. So you had the, the, the scarcity time of Jamestown and all of that is, is over. Um, and so people are looking for land and opportunity and wealth, right? And that, that's kind of a key component of it too, is wealth and land, right? They weren't coming over for spreading religion or anything else that way, or, or even initially starting a family, the tobacco brides. Yes, I guess in that sense, but also for opportunity. But all these men were coming over because it gave them an opportunity as an indentured servant to eventually own their own land. Um, and more men than women came over, uh, in those earlier periods, which talked about why it gave a benefit to tobacco brides in the first place. So that's, that's the passengers bound for Virginia. Now we have the passengers bound for new England, which, so the, this is the Puritans and, um, there's the way that this is set up is a little bit different. And the reason for that is based on the structure of what their society is going to be. The very first person listed on here is Joseph Hull. And what you should hopefully have noticed when you were looking at this is that we get a couple different things. We get the name and age, which are the same as uh, passengers bound for Vir Virginia. Um, but then you also get their job or profession title and family connection. Um, and, and well, and if it's the, the head of the household, right, then they're at the top of the list. The other thing of course, is that the husband, uh, is first on the list and everyone else is referenced to it. Right. So if you see his wife, I know it's small here, sorry, his daughter, his son, his son, his daughter, his daughter, his daughter, his daughter, his servant, his servant. So then you also have servant and children. This tells you, so they broke them up by family unit. The Puritans came over as family units, as husband, wife, and children and servants. Um, and that the fact that they tell their job title, and it is important that the minister is first because the minister in Puritan society was one of the most important people within the society, not only is running the church, but they tend to be politically involved in the society because the reality was religion and politics were interconnected within Puritan society. So they came over as family units. Um, and, and so you have an equal ratio of men to women. This is immediately 
going to change the nature of the society for women compared to um, right this ratio here where there are more men than women by a lot right and and so that gave as we talked about right benefits to some of the early women that came over because of that disparity between how many men and how many women were there but here on this you have an equal ratio of men to women because they came over as families we also know that they paid for their own way um, the fact that you are looking at such a large family unit right this could get very expensive puritans were largely middle to upper middle class they had a good amount of wealth and um, they were able to pay for their voyage over as a community. So not only as family units, but almost as a community as well. And then you have these jobs that are specialized. And if you look through the jobs, uh, clothier, so uh, like a making clothing, um, tailor, uh, tailor, you have husbandmen. So you have a couple farmers, right? But a lot of these, uh, Cooper, there's some farmers. Um, you have the specialized jobs, uh, as well as farmers. And, and that's important because it's also going to be the structure of their society as well, that they had farmers. Um, they also had more with trade and merchants in town and kind of came set up with their own community ready to go with who they needed um, and the positions for society as a whole. So like I said, by looking at this, we can say, okay, obviously family, obviously the fact that, um, that they were coming over in larger groups and paying for their own way. Um, the other key thing that I think it's important to notice, and I, I circled it, right, the his daughter, his son, each of the head of the household, the husband, is listed, and then it goes his, 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 his. Um, so everyone else is in the family is uh, referenced in terms of the husband, and that there was a strong patriarchal structure in their society. And that was a hierarchy of the husband as head of the household. We'll look at family relations in just a minute, but that was important. And um, the minister is at the top of that list uh, within the society, not only within his family, but within his society. It, there, it's not accidental that he's and his family are listed as number one on this list. Um, it wasn't that they just happened to, to, they took it in random order, that he is the head of the community as a whole and he's listed first with his family, but then each husband, right, is listed and uh, the other family members are referenced in terms of who they are connected to, which male authority they are connected to. Um, and that's going to be important when we look at family life and even religion uh, and how women um were viewed in Puritan society and the opportunities or lack of opportunities that they had. Um, so that the passenger list, like I said, tells you a lot. Just looking at a list of, of names on, on kind of how the structure of society went uh, within that. So if we go back to here, right, we can say that what we know from the passenger list um, has to do with um, family units with a, a ready-made society um, and, and women of, of like I said, uh, equal um, standing, not social standing, but, but uh, equal um, numbers. Okay, there we go. So let's put that in there here. We'll go with um, family units, wealthy, um, patriarchal, uh, specialized jobs, and then um, uh, everyone, well, we already guess the patriarchal is everyone re reference to it. Well, and then, yeah, with family units, I think it's important, right? Women and children. 
and the importance of we'll do the minister. Okay, so structure of their towns. They set up their towns very different than um, the plantation style farming that emerges in um, the Chesapeake area. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is going to be that um, New England was not uh, as conducive for large plantations, which was intentional. They didn't need that. They didn't want that. Um, that wasn't their plan. Um, the other reason being that 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 what that wasn't their main economy. They um, their main economy was trade, um, and and so that they're not going to be um, a cash crop society. Um, instead, it the structure was on the town uh, and and of society, um, and and the connected to religion. Everything goes back to religion, right? The whole point was that it was meant to be uh a town that was based on religious principles uh and beliefs uh structured their town and then the other part being that trade uh was the main economy So the, the fact that they came over as family units was also important to the structure of town and they created small family farms, right? So it wasn't that they didn't have, uh, they had farms, but they were small family farms. Um, and then the trade um, was uh, where you're gonna have the center of town with the port in Boston. the structure um, or we'll say setup of the town was super important as well uh, the the key for the setup of town is what was that um, uh, the homes were close together and uh, the goal was that everything was visible remember that um, the John Calvin's view, which the Pur Puritans kind of, of, of took with them, was the idea that people were inherently uh, bad, and so you had to force them to be good. So one of the ways to do that was to um, be able to keep an eye on everyone, if you will. So um, I'm, I'm going to you know, draw a little outline here. Um, my, my drawing skills are not fantastic, but it'll give you the idea of kind of how a structure. Um, so that whereas the Chesapeake was very spread out, you had in the Puritan initial Puritan development, I'll give a little room for the, the expansion here, you had what was essentially set up as a middle walkway, and then on either side you had homes. And the purpose again of this was so that everyone could kind of see everyone and know what was going on. And then you'd have your home here, that seems to do that each time your home here and then the family farm right the small farm th there and so this was the main uh you know town of, of of where people lived and and that the idea was again that they could everyone could see everyone you looking this way looking that way more importantly everyone walking through the center of town um would be would be seen and then where this would become in, important is right on when you're going to church everyone knew who was going to church who wasn't going to church then you had the the center of um, the economic aspect of town um, which would be the town center where you would have um, the church right we'll uh we'll do, we'll do that so here is the church. You would have shops and then there was a school and that's going to be important. We'll talk about that in a minute uh, with what that meant. And then here was the waterfront for trade. Um, the wealthier people, the, so this was, there were two parts, right? The town and then town center. And then eventually as, as the Puritan society continued to grow, you also had the country. And here you had larger farms 
Um, well, the, the, so you had um, the country, and these were farms, but this was the poorer area. This was the wealthier area. This also tended to be, um, we'll say expansion, right? So older families uh, of the first people who moved tended to be in town, newer families here. And this is gonna be important for the Salem witch trials and the tensions because uh, these two groups didn't particularly like each other and, and they argued and had tiffs about stuff. Um, now, the, the point of this was, right, that you, when it was time to go to church, everyone could see you walk to church. People could keep an eye on each other. So why there was suspicion of the country is they were more isolated. And the whole point of the town um, was to be responsible for each other. You were supposed to uh, keep an eye on your neighbor and know what was going on so that you kept them from sinning. Um, right? This, this kept people accountable to, um, you know, the religious beliefs and practices and, and behavior, as well as ultimately reinforce, um, a religious structure. Because then, you know, you could, the whole, the, everything was supposed to be centered around, the community and the religious function with the church being at its core, the, the political structure and council was, was in the town center area as well. Um, and the governing body was connected to religious leadership. Um, and, and so the, the, the ministers uh, were often part of the political uh, rule as well. The other structure for women then as how, how did this impact women with this structure? Well, one, one of the things that was important to it, um, was education. And this was unique because, um, in the Chesapeake women were, were largely illiterate and not educated. Um, but in Puritan society, education was very important. And the reason, um, for that um, had to do with um, the Bible. The, there was an expectation with, with Protestant Reformation and any of the subsets that connected to it that you um, needed to read the Bible. You were responsible for interpreting and understanding to a degree. The ministers helped you, but it was a rejection of the Pope and the idea that the priests were the authority of God and they kept people from reading the Bible to, to make their own interpretations. So both boys and girls um, went to public school. They went to, to basically elementary school. Now only boys could continue on to what became essentially college later on for being becoming ministers. Um, uh, the elementary school, both boys and girls were educated every town, um, because obviously there was more than one Puritan town had a church and, uh, a school. So you had, uh, women were, um, literate, basically, um, the entire community. It would have been really rare to have someone be illiterate in Puritan society because they all went to public school. So that's important. Um, and what they were educated in, in in school is that they had to be able to read. Um, well, let's see, we'll put what they learned. That wasn't just literacy. That was one of them, obviously, is that you had to be able to read so you could read the Bible. And it was important for girls to be able to read the Bible, too. And we'll look at that when we talk about religion. But they also taught them history and literature because these were things that were seen as necessary for um, understanding the Bible, geography, and language. Languages. Right, you needed to understand Greek and Roman history if you wanted to understand the Bible. You needed to understand other history if you wanted to really understand the Bible. And that was super important to them. So 
um, girls um, in Puritan society ended up with a, a really quality education uh, for the time frame compared to women everywhere else because of the connection to religion. So that certainly was one of the benefits of being a woman in Puritan society is that you were, for the time, highly educated. The other thing that was unique to their town and the society was uh, had to do with legal um, aspects. Um, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll put that, the legal, um, legal, what, opportunities? <laughs> uh, I don't know if it is a great opportunity, but one of the legal opportunities that women had equal to men that was also rare is that women uh, could sue both men and women in court. And, and the reality is, is that in other societies in the, English, or the Chesapeake area, um, women had very little standing um, to go to court and sue uh, people. Because, in part because of Femme Covert, and, and the Puritans did practice Femme Covert to a degree, but there were kind of all these exceptions based on their religious beliefs. Um, and, and so uh, women could sue both men and, um, and women, and that's important, right? It wasn't just women. Women could sue men in court. One of the, the number one thing that uh, people sued for in Puritan society was slander. Um, because your reputation was everything. Um, because your reputation um, helped with you financially. Uh, your reputation was connected to your godliness and religious devoutness, if you will. Um, and, and women, it was an avenue for women to protect themselves. Um, and it's not surprising that slander... Um, was so prevalent in Puritan society because of just look at the structure of their town. They set it up to tattle on each other. They set it up to pay attention and know what's going on and, and basically shame someone who doesn't follow their, their standards and norms. And so gossip was, as much as, as gossip was seen as, as a bad thing, it's what happened because of how they set it up. So women were allowed to go to court and sue, uh, not just for slander. Slander just happened to be the number one thing that, that people sued for, and women especially. Um, so if someone, and, and when we look at witchcraft, right, there were periods throughout uh, Puritan society where people were accused of witchcraft, um, but not the Salem witch trial and that hysteria, right? It was singular events, or women were, were uh, you know, uh, there were rumors that were spread about a woman being um, what, not following the religious code or, or whatever or that she was having an affair or so on and so on. And then she would take the person to court and um, sue for it. And if she won, then the person usually had to do two things, pay damages and actually monetary fines and recant the slander, which then was, you know, made public and written in the law, the legal books and court documents, and they did record their, their court documents, so that that could be essentially if, if you felt like you were slandered and there was something that was hurting your reputation, it was a way to um, restore your reputation. And you could prove that I, look, this was said about me and court, the court ruled in my favor, therefore what was being said is null and void, and it did. It usually worked um, to where then one's reputation was restored if the court voted in your favor. And then you got the monetary compensation for um, pain and suffering, essentially. And women sued a lot. Um, they, they were uh, prolific <laughs> uh, within the court system because of how much the, your reputation, especially for women, but men too, but especially for women, your reputation was uh, incredibly important in Puritan society. And, and so um, they were active participants in it. But again, it, it was unique because you don't see that type of kind of legal uh, authority uh, outside of Puritan society in the early colonization period. Now, if we look at their religion, and religious structure, right? I, I mentioned um, uh, one of the things that uh, was connected to it was predestination. Um, and predestination was, um, is going to be connected to the visible saints. So again, predestination was the idea that it was already determined whether or not you were saved or not. 
And Puritans believe then visible saints were kind of the elite of, of the community. What's interesting is economically, the Puritans were, even though I mentioned I, I showed the country and that was the poorer area, that developed over time. Early Puritans were largely uh, equal in economic status. Um, and in part of that's because they did look out for each other, um, especially early on until they grew larger and um, uh, rarely were families left destitute. Rarely were women left destitute. The community took them in and, and provided for them and helped them get on their feet. Um, so social class was less designated by your economic wealth initially but rather or not you were a visible saint. Visible saints were full members of the church and both men and women um, could be visible saints. And most of the time, um, uh, if your husband was a visible saint, you were as well. But what's interesting is that um, it was an individual thing. So uh, women didn't automatically become a visible saint just because their husband was. Um, there were two things that required you to be a visible saint. One is that you had been baptized and the other was that you had had a conversion experience. So in, um, in uh, Puritan society, um, the belief was is that uh, all men and women were equal um, in, in a spiritual sense. Um, I, let's see, where can I, I'm going to put that over here with that. Um, we put it before predestination on there. Um, it, it is an, is an important part of it. Um, that, uh, I'll, I'll put that in just a minute because I want to make sure that's clear, right? It's spiritually all men and women were equal in reality and practical application. All men and women, women were not equal. But, but the belief within the religious structure was that women were equal to men uh, before God. And so um, the, the, we'll talk about the visible saints, why they had the policies that women followed as well. Um, some of the other things that they had women do were very much connected to that belief that women were equal spiritually. But then they also had all these other things that practically didn't align with that idea. So um, for as a woman, you had to be baptized, you had to have a conversion experience. Um, the conversion experience was essentially um, uh, an experience with God. That's the, the best way to say it. Rather, you have this feeling or, or uh, you know, moment, and then you had to share it in front of the church. Now, what's interesting is that um, women uh, were not allowed to speak publicly in church um, except for their conversion experience. So here is where practically women were not equal. Uh, women were not allowed to speak in church except for this. So yes, you're, you're equal spiritually, but you're also not allowed to actually speak in front of church. So why they had this? Well, this goes back to predestination. Um, and, and the fact that if everyone is, is already determined to be saved, how do you know who's saved? Um, right. Or everyone's either determined to be saved or not. How do you know that they're, who's going to be saved? Well, the idea was because if you had nothing, then what would be the point of the church, right? You're like, well, it doesn't really matter what I do. I could be a, mur a mass murderer and it's already been predetermined whether or not I'm saved or not. So the idea was, well, your actions and, and, your, and your behaviors were likely a reflection of whether you were saved or not. And one of the ways that they could guess, and they did say like, we can't know for sure who's, who's already been determined to be saved or not, but we can have a good general idea based on who's a visible saint. And a visible saint is more likely to be saved because they've been baptized and they've had a conversion experience. Um, and so you'd have this experience and then as a, a woman, you'd have your one chance to speak in church and you'd get up and you would, ex and you would share it. Um, and usually, you know, it was about how you felt God's presence and, you know, you were struck by a warmth and light and felt God's presence. And then um, if your, your experience was deemed, you know, uh, legit, which most of the time it was, um, then you became a visible saint. 
and then you were a full member of the church. Um, and, and full members of the church did have benefits because ultimately not only were they full members of the church, but then they ended up being the political elite in terms of, uh, and, and social elite in terms of family. So while the women might not be the political elite, socially they were the politically elite. The ideal, the goal of visible saints um, in the beginning was that all um, Puritan uh, peoples became visible saints. The reality is um, that that's not what happened um, because of really the baptism part and the conversion part as well. Um, the, so the reality does not happen. You end up having um, two things. One, you have uh, children not baptized because their parents are not visible saints. And because you had to be a visible saint to, to baptize your kids or the conversion experience was problematic. And we'll see Anne Hutchinson is actually going to critique that um, a, as an issue. Um, because what happened, because it was public, um, uh, many people questioned, especially women more than men, questioned their experience. Um, and and be, part of that is because um, they're, they're, they're one of the largest uh, sins, as they saw, it, was lying. And um, so, so this, um, this impacted women a lot. And, and, and probably also because it was like the one time they could get up in front of church and, and so trying to, to prove that. And so if someone before you gets up and is, has this crazy experience, like, oh, I experienced for two hours I lay prone on, on the floor uh, as this warmth enveloped me and blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, oh, I just had a tingly feeling and, and, and felt God, you know, hugging me. Well, maybe I didn't have a conversion experience. Mine wasn't anywhere close to that. And they started questioning whether they did, and so they were hesitant to go up. And it makes sense that why women would be more hesitant than men because they were barred from speaking in church. And this was their one time. And then you couple that with that the, the lying as kind of this ultimate sin. Um, and so women would hear other st men and women's stories and then question their own experiences and then, and then second guess that maybe that was an experience. And so they'd hold off on the conversion experience. But then if you did that, you didn't become a visible saint. And if you didn't become a visible saint, you couldn't baptize your children. And if the children weren't baptized, they couldn't become visible saints no matter what they did. So that created a, a, a social class divide between the visible saints and those that were not. Everyone that came over initially in Puritan society were visible saints. But as time went on, right, it, it spread out. Eventually they have to um, rectify this with the halfway covenant, which is where uh, it allowed children who hadn't been baptized as children, um, or it allowed people who weren't visible saints to baptize their children. Um, to try because it was increasingly getting less and less visible saints as time went on. Um, so that, that was an important part of the structure for um, the belief, but also like I said, where women did um, get to participate, right? So right, technically women were equal spiritually, but as we just saw um, in, you know, pract in practical application, um, that didn't necessarily happen. So where they were equal though first, right? They could be visible saints. Um, that was not restricted to them. They were, uh, it, they were taught to read, um, and write specifically for religious purposes and saw as, a um, important enough that women needed because they were equal that they should right? They, this the religious reasons, right? They should read the Bible, right? It, they didn't limit it to men reading the Bible for their family. Um, and, and then the fact that, right, that they participated in the conversion experience where it was not equal. Okay. Right. So that was, 
we'll put here equal and then we'll do not equal was of course that um, women could not talk in church obviously women could not be pastors um, or the ministers they were limited in 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 those ways um, they were also uh, limited in education just in terms of higher ed right there was no higher education option for women one of the things that they were allowed to do which comes from women not being able to talk in church is that women were encouraged um, to form their own Bible studies so you couldn't talk in church but you could go form a Bible study group with other women and why not talk in church because the belief was is that women should not teach men and they they draw drew that from uh, biblical references so uh, women should not teach men um, so that's where it comes from they said women but but you know while you can't talk in church and while you know women shouldn't teach men women should have their own Bible studies with other women and they did um, encourage women also to question which is interesting um, because right they they get all up in a hissy about questioning so they encourage women to question and figure um, out stuff on their own to a point right so so there's there's a big like however with this however um, you could you could go too far you you were encouraged to have your Bible studies you were encouraged to explore the Bible um, you were encouraged to ask questions and challenge to a degree you were still ultimately under the authority of your husband and the ministers and so if the ministers um, said you know this is the way it is and then you asked why that would be fine and encouraged and they might explore you to figure that out but if you start pushing and going I think you're wrong and then the manager's like no no this is what it is yours you just you're just stop and we'll see this is where like Ann Hutchinson gets in trouble because she keeps pushing if you're having a Bible study and the ministers tell you like well, you need to not do that not not have the not uh, not that you have to stop having the Bible study but stop doing whatever maybe you were doing in the Bible study that they didn't like you're to obey them right and they they're gonna we'll see that word with it that there definitely is the obey the ministers right they are the head of society it's the ministers and then your husband so the ministers are head of the society the husbands are head of the family and women were ultimately under the hierarchical structure of of a male in some form or another in Puritan society um, and and that's important because it, it plays a role in um, kind of everything that they do so you, it's this weird balance of like we're incur we're teaching you to read and write we want you to to uh, come to your own conclusions as long as it doesn't challenge what we say so that's that's the line as, as long as it doesn't challenge what the minister says or your husband says and as long as you stop and then fall in line with that everything's okay the problem came for women when they pushed back against that. They did not like that at, at all. Um, so that's the religious structure um, for family life and the role of husband and wife. So this is also um, unique. And the Puritans are interesting, this interesting dichotomy of, of, of oppressive and strict against women in some ways and way more open and freeing in other ways again because they were educated they did get certain benefits that the rest of the, of the you know the early colonization didn't get um, they were encouraged to question to a degree but again that, that just don't challenge the men in this situation 
you ultimately still have to fall under the authority of the minister and your husband, but you have this weird freedom in between to do some things. You can sue in court. You get to go to school, right? And, and yet then you have this very strict religious structure of, of how you behave and what you do. So in family life, um, um, of course, the biggest thing was marriage um, and an emphasis, I mean, the whole good wife uh, component, right? Marriage was seen as the foundation of society to the Puritans. And in, in a lot of places, we saw the importance with the tobacco brides and, and, and saw that. So it was a foundation of society. And then your goal with that was um, also to raise children, raise godly children. And, and the, they were important because, um, the being married was important, um, not only for, of course, having children and, and growing the society, um, but because it was seen as necessary for survival. But it's not surprising that, um, right, what we see with, within this, um, the marriage and, and a, being a wife right, is the whole thing with the good wife and the ideal role to be married and have children. Um, within marriage, though, like I said, it was a, a economically um, essential or important for survival. Within the Chesapeake, you had indentured servants, um, you had large farms and and so that kind of was a component of your survival with production but the in the puritan society they were smaller family farms you needed the family unit to work together for survival and so one of the things that's interesting is that it's often termed as a partnership well again here's going to be the weird dichotomy with that so this is the positive of it is that in in terms of what they encouraged is that husband and wife would be affectionate, um, affection and love towards each other. Right. They encouraged uh, husband and wife to show, um, love and affection, uh, towards each other. Um, and sex was encouraged in marriage. One of the other misconceptions was that the Puritans were all stuffy and, and anti-touch and fun. Um, and that's not the case. So sex was encouraged in marriage. It, they were encouraged to be a partner, a partnership in some ways. However, um, because the whole society was structured on, on the family. Ultimately though, right, the husband was head of the household. And everything still ultimately deferred to him. So as much as it's a partnership and they talk about that as working together and, and building trust and love and friendship, you had to do what your husband said. He had complete control because it was very much a strict patriarchal structure. Um, and at the same time, women could get divorced. So do you see how um, it goes back and forth? Women were able to initiate divorce, which was super rare. Now, there, it still favored men and men were able to do so. Uh, there, there were certain things that what women could get divorced for, but that wasn't even something that women could, could initiate in, in the Chesapeake region. So women could get divorced um, and um, that gave them some ability to make sure that like they weren't being abused um because you could if you, that and that's one of the important things with divorce is that it actually uh lowers the rate of abuse within a, a relationship because that women aren't trapped in that having to put up with that um and again the, it was still more difficult for women than men but it was something you could do a husband was the head of the household um, and yet they were encouraged to show love and affection and care for each other and treat each other nicely and be a uh, guide, guide, uh, guiding lights for their children. I wanted to look at um, John Winthorpe's speech and just a part of it. One of the things that's interesting is it talks about um, the type of liberty, which also shows, again, this idea of obedience and subordination within the society as a whole. That was an important component for them. 
Um, but then, and the, the way that they reference women and explain it also shows you kind of where women's place within that was. So he, he says right there is twofold liber liberty, natural, which uh, I, I mean as our, now, our nature is now corrupt, or, and civil or federal. The first is common to man with beast and other creatures. By this man hath liberty to do what he wants, and is liberty to do evil as well as good. This liberty is incompatible and inconsistent with authority and cannot endure the least restraint of the most just authority. So natural liberty is bad. The civil or federal liberty is good. And what it's saying here is natural liberty is the liberty to do what you want. And why that is bad is because it, it, um, it could be, it, natural liberty technically could be the choice to do good, but it's incompatible and inconsistent with authority. It does not go with authority. And the Puritans loved their authority. <laughs> um, and so the other kind of liberty I call civil or freedom Oh, uh, it'd also be being moral. You, so if they see moral liberty, federal liberty, or civil liberty, this liberty is the proper and, end, uh, proper end and object of authority and cannot subsist without it. It is a liberty to, to that only which is good, just, and honest. Right? So this liberty is good, just, and honest. So natural liberty can um, be good. But it also can be evil. Um, and, and whereas uh, moral liberty is good, just, and honest, it's for authority. This liberty hath maintained an exercise in the way of subjection to authority. It is uh, the same kind of liberty where Christ hath made us free. So the idea is that subjection to authority is in itself a, li a, t a type of liberty. Then they get, this is where he gets the example for women. The women, woman's own choice makes a man her husband. Yet being so chosen, he is her Lord and she is to be subject to him. Yet in a way of liberty, not of bondage. And a true wife accounts her um, subjection, uh, her honor and freedom and would not think her condition safe and free but in her subjection to her husband's authority, such as the liberty of the church under the authority of Christ. So, right, that's this idea that they're comparing it to this, the, well, to uh, people's willingness to be subject to Christ's authority, to God's authority, and saying it's the same as for women. Women have the liberty to choose, and they choose to be, uh, to marry their husband and be under his authority. And they don't see that as bondage, but an honor and freedom, right? So it's interesting, right? But it does show, again, this expectation of, um, of being under husband's authority. And the idea that you are to follow it because you willingly chose to do so, and that that being under your husband's authority is honor and freedom. So as much as you have these positives of, of the role, right? It was believed that women were subject to absolute authority of husband. So you, you really do have these, these mixed messages that get sent out um, to women in Puritan society. Here you have some freedoms, but you also don't have these. Um, one of the other things that was interesting is that, uh, it has to do with premarital sex and, um, the lack of it being super taboo. Um, they, they basically ignored premarital sex. Um, Essentially, um, 
that was okay. There was, again, women were sexual beings, right? <laughs> so there was kind of an expectation. Yeah, people are going to have sex. However, if you got pregnant, then it was a different story. Right? Then you were expected to get married to the person you got pregnant with. Assuming, um, you know, well, it, well, it's a whole nother thing, right? If, if there was a, um, they were married. So, uh, adultery, um, was a big, uh, um, no, no in that sense. Right. So, uh, no, um, there were two things for women, right? It was the idea of, um, having an affair with a married man or you being married. Or you're married and have sex with someone else. This was either one of these, right, was would fit under adultery. Um, however, women were largely punished. So if you were you both were not married, premarital sex was ignored and largely okay. If you got pregnant, you were expected to get married. And in fact, they kind of showed it in a, um, a midwife's tale. Um, they believe that um, at the height of pregnancy, you like couldn't lie. And so they would ask uh, as you were giving birth who the father was if you hadn't stated. And then that was legally binding for that man. Um, and then he was um, registered as essentially the father and you were expected to get married. And they show that with like her son and Sally and right, she gets pregnant and then uh, uh, she, the um, Martha Ballard asks her who the father is and she tells him it's her son. And then he, the next scene is like showing him looking very unhappy that they're getting married. That was an expectation of kind of how it worked is, oh, it's okay that you're pregnant. It's okay that you had sex because that's expected, but you were to ha you were to get married um, if you are, if you get pregnant. And so there are definitely, um, there were in the registers, there's a lot of births that took place only if, uh, very shortly after a wedding, um, because that was the ideal. Um, and if not that you got married before you gave birth, that you got married, uh, right after when they discovered who the father was through that investigating technique. Um, and, but, but then again, if it, so that the whole idea of sexuality and what the freedoms that women had were limited in, in some ways, um, and in others, they were given this freedom, but of course, adultery was a big no, no, the men were punished too, but women were far hard. The, the punishment was far harsher for women, um, which is consistent with, of course, the importance and view of the idea of, of, um, uh, virginity is important for the lineage and, and it being a patrilineal society. Uh, and then also it had to do with the fact that the Puritan belief that women were sexual beings. So women were seen as what more responsible, uh, more, more of the instigator. They were the ones that were the sexual beings. So there was a harsher punishment for that behavior. And then of course, just the fact that women were under the authority of men. And so the consequences tended to be harsher for them anyway. Um, so that's the, so marriage, premarital sex. Um, the other thing uh, we look at is widows, um, because that's an important one to address because we looked at widows, um, in Chesapeake area. And it was actually, you could, it could be a benefit to women to become a widow because you became femme soul and you could become wealthy. However, uh, widows were not looked on favorably. Widows were, uh, not a positive thing for women in Puritan society. And, uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. One has to do with there was uh, single women or that whole femme, one, they didn't like the femme soul and ha them having that authority, um, right? They were seen as dangerous. The idea of being uh, without um, a male authority was seen as bad. So here again, you have this harsher restriction. Um, 
and it's, this will play a role in the, the Salem witch trials. Um, because widows were just kind of looked on suspiciously. In fact, for the first year at least, after you were widowed, um, you had to move in with a respectable family. Like, you couldn't take care of yourself. <laughs> Single women who never got married also had to live with a family. So it wasn't just widows. It was, it really was, I mean, it was widows, but, and the, there were less single women um, who never got married. But there were a few. And single women who never got married had to live with a family as well. And the reason for this um, was because of that view that women uh, without male authority were dangerous. So by putting them with a good visible saint family that had a, a male head of the household, they became under there. So essentially the idea of, right, this femme soul didn't exist much at all. You stayed femme covert, either under your, your husband, your father, your husband, or uh, um, another male that you lived with in their household. They didn't ever put you under a single male, right? It was a married man. So the idea was that, that it protected them. But um, you had, as a widow, right, you had to, for the first year, you had to live with that family. And only after you could prove, you had to prove you um, were, I guess, safe, right? That you weren't a danger that, you know, and that, that would be connected to religious uh, uh, aspects, how um, non-defiant you were. Essentially, if you could show that you were submissive and weren't going to challenge things, then you might be allowed as a widow, um, to move back on your own. And that did happen. But, um, it, when widows were just looked on with suspicion. So being a widow in Puritan society, there was, um, no economic or social benefit, right? You, um, you didn't get the femme soul. You didn't get the money from your husband. There was no benefit to being a widow. Widows were largely, uh, um, looked on as, as potentially dangerous. And so they have, everyone kept an eye on them. Um, and, and yet at the same time, uh, remarriage was rarely allowed. Remarriage was not common um, because you had to get approval and that rarely happened. Um, it, it was a few cases where they allowed it for various reasons of whether it was raising kids or, or certain circumstances. But so you, if, if your husband died, you got stuck in this, this land of being a widow, which, which really limited your freedom within the society. So again, just this kind of weird structure of, of where women had freedom and where they didn't. Um, all right. So that's, um, family. The only other thing I want to mention is just girls, children, young girls, um, because this will come up with, um, um, the Salem witch trials, right? If you're looking at within the structure of society, um, Actually, let's be more specific because if you were younger, it, teenage girls, um, like think middle school, so tween actually probably, um, but that you have, uh, if you're looking at the uh, social order and structure, right, you have the, the husband or father, right, the wife and mother. And then it would be sons, and then it would be daughters. And then servants were underneath that. But in terms of where you ranked, they were one of the uh, most marginalized, besides servants, in society. But the servants weren't usually seen as Puritans, right? So out of the Puritans, you were one of the most marginalized groups. 
because when you were it, so because your role your ultimate role as a, a girl was to be a wife and mother and so you're kind of in this in-between phase right there's you have young child where you're still a, a little child and children essentially would have a higher value because they aren't um, they're little kids they need to be taken care of but then you have the the teenage years and then you have the eligible for uh, marriage right and and this phase is the um it's the one at one of the least important groups and and groups in um point right because when this is definitely when you're of marriageable of of marriage age right then all of a sudden you become important again because you're serving your purpose and that's part of that whole dangerous thing right a single woman is no longer serving her ideal role and purpose which is to be married and have kids when you're a young child that's not expected yet when you're in, and the, but then when you're teenage years you're no longer that little kid but you're not quite of mar marriageable age and so they become one of the least important groups and that's going we'll, we're going to come back to that when we talk about the serum witch trials and it's no surprise that the hysteria and the things that get surrounded by it center around a group of teenage girls um, because they for the first time in their life were getting more attention and more important than ever before um, and so it plays a role so girls really had this kind of uh, middle phase where they were um, they really had a low value in society and and so because they were marginalized in that way um, That attention they're gonna get it is, is kind of gonna fuel things um, So that's an important part too is right they women were important when they were of, of marriageable age or when they were children and then seem kind of less so in between um, Okay, so that's the kids the last thing that we'll look at is then um, uh, challenge to the Anne Hutchinson um, you did have women that challenged the system. Uh, it, it didn't usually go well for them. Uh, Anne Hutchinson would be, she's the most famous of that. Um, but it, they, they did, there were challenges. Women were exiled for um, uh, bucking up against the system, going against traditional roles and, and rules uh, in that process. Um, so she, um, she, uh, challenged, well, she came in and she did a couple of things. So the first thing she did is that she had a Bible study, which in of itself is not a bad thing. Um, but it was so popular, um, that at times apparently more people attended than the church and men and women attended right and women are not supposed to teach men um, and then she challenged a couple things she challenged um, the conversion experience which not super radically by the way um, she just challenged it the public nature of it um, she didn't ask to abolish it she just what she said is that um, it should be a private experience. Rightly so. She saw the issue with why women especially were not having conversion experiences is because it was public and that, that, that they were then, you know, judging their legitimacy of their conversion experience based on other people's. And then she ultimately challenged, um, the political and religious leadership. And remember what we talked about with that moral authority is that um, you don't challenge that. Um, and, and, and so she did. Um, and, and ultimately wasn't following like uh, a proper you know, role of, of a woman. The, the moral authority you were supposed to fall in line, you were not supposed to challenge that, the men in that way because she was ultimately seen as a dangerous person. Um, and and uh, she challenging the visible saints by challenging the conversion experience um, and challenging the ministers by not stopping. So they asked her to stop the Bible study 
and she refused, which there was the first big no-no for, for women. Um, and then, um, the fact that she challenged, um, what the minister was preaching and their whole visible saints, which were the political elite with the conversion experience, all of that led to her eventually being, uh, brought to court. So she was, um, charged kind of, um, they, they didn't give her, uh, specific crimes, but they charged and went to trial. So what I want to look at is the trial of Anne Hutchinson and more specifically what she was charged with. So we know what she did, right? Had a Bible study that was more popular than church. Men and women both attended. And then she challenged the current version experience. And in the process of doing that and refusing to stop, challenged the political and religious authority which is directly a, a, a challenge to that moral liberty. She essentially did not follow moral liberty like you were supposed to. And, and all of that, right, then labels her as a dangerous woman. Because she, even though she was married and her husband supported her, she wasn't following the minister and the elders, which the minister was above your husband in terms of that authority because the only person above them was God. Um, so let's look at the um, trial and try to figure out what they're charging with, which is a lot of different things. She's actually really smart. So what's really impressive with this trial is that she totally had them like every, every question, every, every charge, she had an answer back. And it's only at the end that she essentially slips up and they use that and grab onto that to exile her. And she ultimately does get exiled. Um, um, but they didn't exile her right away. So let's go ahead and take a look at that and then and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so this is a transcript of Anne Hutchinson. Um, and right, it talks about she arrived in Boston in 1634 and was a follower of John Cotton, who was one of the main ministers. Um, who preached, um, and um, she began to hold meetings to discuss her views with other women and men, and they charged her with heresy. Um, but we'll see, they didn't start out charging her with heresy, right? This becomes the end result because of that, what she does at the end. So this first paragraph tells us a lot about what was charged, which is why I was bummed in your book, it doesn't include this part. Like this is one of the most important parts, I think, of the trial because it lists like kind of all these charges against her and a lot of them are targeted towards her sex as a woman and and that these are things because as a woman she did not just as a person in puritan society so that is important right these things that they're critiquing her on are because she's a woman doing them not because she's a, a puritan doing them mrs hutchinson you're called here as one of those who have troubled the peace of the commonwealth and the churches here. So there's one thing they're saying, right, that um, that she's done is she's troubled the peace of the commonwealth and the churches. You are known to be a woman, right, that, that again, not just someone, a woman that have had a great share in the promoting and divulging of these opinions that are the cause of this trouble. So then it goes back, right, a woman who's caused trouble with peace and commonwealth. And to be nearly joined, not only in affinity and affection with some of those the court have taken notice of and past censure upon you, but you have spoken diverse things, as we've been informed, very prejudicial to the honor of the churches and ministers. So again, the um, that she's spoken diverse things against the men of uh, Puritan society. And you've maintained a meeting and an assembly in your house that have been condemned by the General Assembly so this is the Bible studies, right? As a thing not tolerable, no, nor comely in the sight of God, nor fitting for your sex, right? So it, this is the Bible study, but it's important, right, that it's saying it's because it's not fitting for your sex. And notwithstanding that was cried down, you have continued the same. So that, that's just saying, we told you to stop, you didn't. That, that's what notwithstanding that was cried down, you've continued the same. So there's claiming, look, it, this isn't the first time and we're just telling you about it now. We asked you to stop and you kept going. And therefore we have thought good to send for you to understand how things are. And if you be in an erroneous way, we may reduce you that so that you may become a profitable member here among us. Otherwise, if you be obstinate in your course and then the court may take such course that you may trouble us no further. 
So one of the things that is interesting, right, is that they did look for resolution. As much as I, I'm, I had said that the, the Puritans liked to um, exile people, which they did, they never, they didn't usually do it on the first try. They did give people chances, right? So again, Puritan society is this crazy dichotomy between super strict and super harsh for women to, oh, they're kind of tolerant in these various and progressive and other. It's just a weird mix because they, they, they just didn't stick to one way and do it. They kind of mixed in. We're going to teach women how to read and write. We're going to encourage them to question things. We're going to give them multiple chances. But we're not going to be tolerant of, of women challenging male's authority or pressing the boundaries. And we will exile people. Um, women can't speak in church, but go have your own Bible studies. And again, it's the, that back and forth of like, hey, you can sue in court and do this, but you can't do this. You can do this, but you can't do this. That's kind of that too. So they, they did give people chances. You usually had to keep not following the rules uh, several times before they tried to exile you. Rarely did anyone get exiled on the first offense, especially if they were willing to change their ways. And I think that's the part they talked about here, right? Is that, uh, that you may become a profitable member here among us. So that's the end goal. If you'll, if you'll fall in line and stop doing these non-womanly things, then we'll gladly have you be part of our, our society. Um, but if you don't, well, then you may trouble us no further, right? That's the exile. Um, so, right, they've charged her, or they've claimed, right, trouble, uh, trouble the peace and commonwealth with the churches here, spoken diverse things against the churches and ministers, so this really means men, um, had a Bible study, which they say, right, was, was by both men and women attended, and is not tolerable for fitting for your sex, so that, that they, that's clear, right, that the Bible study is a problem because she's a woman. And, and, and not because she's having a Bible study, but because she's having a Bible study that's challenging the church, which are men, and she's teaching men, and she didn't stop when asked. So there's a lot going on with that, right? Therefore, I would entreat you to express whether you do assent and hold and practice these uh, to those opinions and factions that have been handed in court already. That is to say, whether you do not justify Mr. Wheelwright's sermon and the petition. So basically say, now answer yourself. I am called here, so then this is Anne Hutchinson. I am called here to answer before you, but I hear no things laid to my charge. So she's basically saying, what am I actually charged with? Right, so she's snarky the whole time. Like, like I said, I love this, this uh, um, example of this court case because, man, Anne Hutchinson was smart. And she is working them over, like, the whole time. And John Winthrop's like, I've told you some of them already, and more I can tell you. Name one, sir. Have I not named one already? So he's like, wait, didn't I just give you this list here? I mean, we have three, but you'll see what she says. Um, what have I said or done? Why for your doings? This you did harbor and countenance those that are parties of this faction. So what does this mean? This means that she harbored and countenance. She basically encouraged and uh, technically, I guess, housed um, people uh, to dissent, right? I mean, it, it's basically that she encouraged and, and met up with people who, who uh, dissented. That's a matter of conscience, sir. Your conscience you must keep or it must be kept for you. There's that Puritan belief that, that people are inherently bad and that they've got to be held to these, these structures, right? With the whole reason their society is set up that way. Must not I then entertain the saints because I must keep my conscience? Say that one brother should commit felony or treason and come to his brother's house. If he know him guilty and conceals him, to be, him, conceals him he is guilty of the same. It is his conscience to entertain him, but it is his conscience comes into act in giving continence and entertainment to him that has broken the law, then he's guilty. So they're all the same here because she's saying like, you know, my, shouldn't I follow my conscience? And he's like, yes, but here's the example. If you're, you go to your brother's house and you know he's guilty um, 
And then, and then you, so if you go to your brother's house and he hides that he's guilty of a crime, then your conscience is clean. But if you go to your brother's house and you know your brother's guilty and yet you still help him, then you have broken the law and you're guilty too. Um, and so if you do countenance those that are transgressors of the laws, you are in the same fact. So that's again saying, right, if you are, that, that goes back to the whole encouraging and harboring the people that are, are challenging the church and the authority and she says How, what law do they transgress so she goes back to give me a specific law the law of god and state and what in particular so now she's three times she's been like name a law i've broken because you haven't named an actual law you named a whole bunch of grievances against me but you haven't named an actual law why and this among the rest whereas the lord does say honor thy father and mother um so here that's interesting right and that they're saying um she broke the law because she didn't follow the commandment honor thy father and mother we could put that one as i think that's what four um that they're claiming um and then so he's like what law have i broken so then why the fifth commandment and she goes up to that and she says um you know, I have denied, I deny that. Um, and then it goes on, you've, you've, the petition council. So, right, but she just keeps asking questions, right? Question, question, question. So she, everything he says, she questions. What, and then again, what breach of law, sir? Why dishonoring the Commonwealth, Miss Hutchinson? Um, so then they make it clear, right, that like, um, We'll put, uh, I do fear the Lord and my parents. May I not entertain them that fear the Lord because my parents will not give me leave. So then this is what she's using with that. So the first they say, right, honoring the father and mother. But then they're connecting this to honor father and mother. Although they're going to cut out mother, right? It's really about father. And they're going to say the commonwealth. Is essentially the father and so then the, the commandment of honor thy father and mother applies to honoring the commonwealth as well but then she says right this is that if if my uh, I, I if I fear the Lord right should I not you know follow that if my parents will not give me leave to obey the obey God so she's basically right if my parents don't believe in God or my parents are doing the wrong thing shouldn't I be not following my parents if that's following God? If they be fathers of the commonwealth and they of another religion, if you entertain them, then you dishonor your parents and are justly punishable. So basically they're saying the fathers of the commonwealth supersede that, like they know the laws of God and therefore no. <laughs> um, and then it continues to go on um, with with that she says she doesn't acknowledge it why do you keep such a meeting at your house as you do every week upon a set day it is lawful for me to do so as it is all your practice and can be you can find a warrant for yourself and condemn me for the same thing so this is like it's lawful and you guys do it and so how is it okay for you and yet i'm condemned um and then and then they say um Uh, well, and then he goes into, um, what warrant do you continue such a course, right? What, what rule are you saying you have the freedom to do so? Um, and I conceive there lies a clear rule in Titus that the elder woman should instruct the younger, and then I must have a time wherein I must do it. So then she goes and says, this is where it says in the Bible that this is when an elder woman could, should instruct the younger. All this I grant you, I grant you a time for it, but what is this to the purpose that you, Miss Hutchinson, must call a company together from their callings to come be taught by you? If you look up the rule in Titus, it is a rule to me. If you convince me that it is no rule, I shall yield. So then she's like, look, I'm going to stick with Titus saying I have the right to do this. If you can convince me, I'll stop. Um... And then they said that, and then they give one on Corinthians that uh, the elder must instruct the younger about their business and to love their husbands and not to make them to clash. Um, so that, what's interesting here is they're not saying at like, well, you shouldn't teach men. It's saying that you're causing problems. They, they basically said that uh, she is, well, she's causing dissent. She's causing problems because people started questioning the preacher after her Bible studies. Anyways, it goes on and on and on with this about this back and forth. 
and she's totally winning. They everything they throw out at her, she she throws back, and they they can't. Um, they they can't, nothing sticks. So where it goes wrong um, is it's because it ends really quickly, right? Um, let's see. Let's get to where it comes quickly. They keep questioning her. Um, let's go to the end. And this part was in your book. All right. So it says here, right. One of the things that, um, we're not gonna read the whole thing cause it, it, it would take a little bit, but she, she, she's trying to make a point. Um, and, um, this says that the, you know, one of the reasons she knows is, um, um, the spirit told her that, you know, that this was the right thing. And so he says, how do you know that was the spirit? How did Abraham know it was God that bid him offer his son being a breach of the sixth commandment by an immediate voice? So to me by an immediate revelation. And then look at his response, how an immediate revelation. So this is not allowed. Puritan society um, and Puritan belief was that God did not directly speak to people. Um, so she's killing it, this whole thing. Like everything, I skipped through some of it, but like we got the good, the idea. Every charge, every argument they made, she countered and they could not beat her. The whole trial is one example of how smart Ann Hutchinson is. But finally at the end, whether it was because she got worn down or just felt like sharing that was her belief, um, she said one of the reasons why that she knew that, that this was allowed was because the spirit told her. And they're like, well, how, would this, how did the spirit tell you? And then that's when she said by immediate voice or well, the same way that God uh, told Abraham and, and by immediate revelation. And then that's why his response, how an immediate revelation, they know that they have her because this was absolutely not allowed. This is where this is where the heresy charge comes in, right? Um, at the beginning, she's charged with heresy, or it says in the introduction, she ends up being charged with heresy. Um, she's charged with heresy because of an immediate revelation. They could not stick all those other ones we listed. The four other things they were throwing out at her, those weren't actual charges that they could have stick. But they stick this one because this is absolutely not allowed in Puritan society. Um, the, the religious belief said that God does not speak directly to people. Conversions experiences weren't God speaking to you. It was his presence you were feeling, but you did, God didn't speak in your head. And, um, and then she, so she finishes with that and they say, um, behold, I turn away from you. Right? So the court changes really quickly after she ta shares this. Um, and, um, I, I do hear, he says, let's see. Um, all, and then it says all the court, but some two or three ministers cry out, uh, the court have already declared themselves satisfied concerning the things you hear and concerning the troublesomeness of her spirit and the danger of her course amongst us, which was not to be suffered. Therefore it be the mind of the court that Miss Hutchinson for these things that appear before us is unfit for our society. And if it be the mind of the court that she shall be banished out of our liberties and imprisoned till she be sent away, let them hold up their hands. All but three did so. Um, so they, they shut her down after because they found something that they could charge her with. And then they exile her after this. Um, and then she asked, I desire to know wherefore I am be banished. Say no more. The court knows wherefore and is satisfied. Um, he also says, Miss Hutchinson, the sentence of the court you hear is that you are banished from out of our jurisdiction as being a woman not fit for our society. Again, interesting, right? That they emphasize a woman not fit for our society and you're imprisoned until the court shall send you away. So it was only that last admission of, um, uh, immediate revelation that got her, her, her kicked out because they couldn't stick any of the other charges, but they were the, throughout this entire hearing, this court trial, right? There is such an emphasis on a woman not fit for society, um, or, or a woman, uh, that's not comely to your sex, right? That's not, that's not appropriate for being a, a woman. Um, 
and and that there, that emphasis is uh, there, or the woman who has sh great share in the promoting and divulging of opinions. So it really it did play a role for the fact that she was a woman challenging the system, right? That that it definitely they I mean they emphasized it themselves it, 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 that if it was a man now there were men that were exiled too. And if they challenged enough, they would as well. But they, they was specifically that they used her being a woman against her as, as part of that. The fact that, um, that she, um, it was like, it was almost like that it was doubly bad because, um, she was a woman who, right, disturbed the peace. It was bad that she was a woman who, um, was disparaging, talking uh, negatively about the church leaders. Right? It was about obeying the commonwealth. More, you know, that could apply to men as well, but, but especially was being used um, as a woman not obeying the commonwealth. Right. The other charges were um, not becoming of a woman behavior, not becoming of a woman. Um, failed to honor her parents or, or the, the Commonwealth. Um, right. That the, it's it's that the, all of these were within the context of of this of a woman challenging the system. So again, while some of these the the men would have. Um, been charged with as well. The fact that they constantly emphasized it as a woman made it worse to them that it was a woman doing these things. Um, so the consequences of this, uh, I mean, she did, she's exiled and, um, her and her husband leave. Unfortunately for them, they end up dying a few years later, um, in, uh, uh, Indian attack on, on the area of the town that they were staying in. Um, she did have an impact though in Puritan society after she left. Um, what, what, what there's interesting statistics with this is that one of the things that they do not too long after she's exiled is that they actually change the conversion experience to private. So, you know, it's like they condemned her and then ended up implementing her, her changes after the fact. The other change we see within, uh, at least within court documents, is that after Anne Hutchinson's court, public, it was a very public court case and exile, uh, women went to court um, to challenge uh, various laws and systems more than they ever did before. So we see an increase in court cases. Um, and we also see more women charged with disorderly behavior than before. So the question is, right, did, you know, what, did this happen as a direct result of Anne Hutchinson? Um, was this just because um, they were more aware of it? Um, and so they were, you know, coming down on it. So, you, so, you know, that, that is a question of, of was it, um, were, were the, uh, we'll say the leaders harsher on women after Anne Hutchinson or was it that, um, so, or more women were challenging the system. I probably was a, a combination of both is that they did, um, start, uh, in order to avoid another Anne Hutchinson event, uh, start charging women, uh, more often, but the number of increase in court cases of women challenged the system was significant enough that you likely have an increase of women feeling that they could and should speak out. So Anne Hutchinson had real, uh, change 
for, uh, not while she was there. And for, I mean, she, you know, she had some with her Bible studies, but there, there definitely was significant change and impact in the Puritan society after she left for women. And, and this also could take an idea when we look at the Salem witch trials is that it really was an attack on women, the, the Salem witch trials, um, and an attack on women as dangerous and challenging authority as witches, of course, rather than anything else. Um, but that you got to look at what's going on with society and you have this increase in women challenging and, 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 and questioning, um, that it kind of was ripe for then this, this pushback against women in general within the society. Um, okay, so that's where we're going to stop with this. We're going to look at the Salem witch trials next, um, what they were, how they got started, how it was connected to Puritan society, and the structure of the trials and kind of all that craziness that happened with it.